Texas. You're the sixth person in our believe, church history to ever wear a tie. I can't believe these people didn't show God respect and put on a tie. Unbelievable. What kind of a church is this? I, I know, like, I would be overdressed any place, but in Colorado, I feel very foolish. So, so just, uh, just pray for me. <laughs> Well, we're glad you're here. I, I think we have, you know, similar backgrounds. Uh, yeah. I went to the University of Illinois, and you went to the University of Illinois of the East. I think it's uh, called it's Yale. It's called Yale University, yeah. yes. So it's a fine, similar there. It's yeah. a fine Marxist atheist institution, yeah. <laughs> just like the University of yeah. Illinois. Yeah. Um, but talk to us a little bit before we get started, just about your testimony. It's too late. We just I, got started. I know. Um, but my, you grew up, I know you grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church, so I know you grew up in a religious environment, but how did Jesus Christ become personal to you? I didn't really grow up in a religious environment. I mean, it's kind of a funny thing. My dad, I always say this, uh, uh, and, and maybe someday I'll come back here and just give my testimony, because a lot of it's very funny. <laughs> but my dad came from Greece in the 50s. My mom came from East Germany, communist, in the 50s. They met in an English class in New York City. And if you're raised by a couple that's Greek and German, that means you will be raised Greek. There's no way around it. Like the Greeks are just gonna, re you know, they're like, they're not gonna have any of that. So, so we went to the Greek Orthodox Church. But for many people, and look, you can get this, you know, there's evangelical churches like this, but a lot of Catholic churches, a lot of Greek Orthodox churches, but they're kind of, it's like a cultural center. So there's, these are good people, but I never got the download of, it's about Jesus, it's about a personal relationship, it's about the Bible, it's about, you know, you kind of, so then when I went to the Marxist atheist institution known as Yale University, uh, if you're not prepared, you know, you will get sucked into that. And I did. And um, I killed some people. No, that's not true. I, uh, but I did get drawn away from God and from, uh, you know, uh, any, all kinds of stuff. I mean, the idea to love America, whatever, I got sucked into all that you know, bad kind of woke thinking. This was in the 80s because it was already in full bloom. That's where it starts, you know. And um, in, uh, I, I wanted to be a writer and uh, was an English major. And after college, I, you know, I kind of graduated. It's like, okay, I want to be a writer. But I grew up in a working class immigrant home where, you know, so my father was going to pick up a phone and call his poet friend. Hey, can you, can you hook up Eric with an internship? Uh, I, so I just kind of drifted around and was really lost. And bottom line is the Lord uh, met me miraculously. And I don't say, you know, I, I don't mean, when I say miraculously, I mean mind-blowing, spoke to me in a dream, uh, in a way that just completely, instantly changed my life. And I was born again, and I, that, that was literally in a dream. So, like, I went to sleep. It's like going to sleep single and waking up married, Right. It was absolutely instantly transformative, and by the grace of the Lord, I, I was born again, and I've been walking with him, you know, ever since, yeah. That's the real, that's true. That's the true version. So let's, let's talk a little bit about faith. I mean, in your book, you talk about the two errors yeah. of faith. Talk a yeah. little bit about faith yeah. and what true faith is. Well, l words are funny things, right? Like, y you can say a word, and... What does it mean, right? Somebody says, I believe in God. Well, what God do you believe in? Ganesh, uh, you know, the, when you use words. And so the word faith, Bonhoeffer actually talks about this. Now, some of you know the story about Bonhoeffer, but he wrote a, an amazing Christian book, Chris classic book called Cost of Discipleship. And the main idea of it is what he calls cheap grace. Because the Lutheran church in the 1930s, when, when he was writing about this, he's, he could see the drift. Because let's say you say, hey, we're saved by faith, and it's all grace. It's nothing we do. Right, 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 okay. We're all saved, we're good, done. And he's like, if you don't understand the price that was paid for you to be saved, if you talk about grace in a, in a cavalier way, like, a, like you take it lightly, you obviously don't understand grace. Like, grace is the most heavy thing in the universe. 
that God sent his son to die a tortured death so that you could be freed from sin. I mean, when you consider what grace is, it just, it's mind-blowing. And if you believe it, if you get it, it will transform your life. And if it doesn't transform your life, maybe you didn't get it. So there was a lot of Germans at that time just kind of going through the motions. And Bonhoeffer wrote this book and saying, that's cheap grace. You need to have real grace. You need to, it's going to change your life. And I basically, faith is the same thing, right? People say, it's all about faith. You believe, you believe. It's not about works. It's about what you believe. You believe? Yeah, I believe. It's like, okay. Scripture also says faith without works is dead. So here's the problem. If you actually believe, okay, you're saved by faith. You're saved in what Jesus did. But if that's true, your life will show it. You will live differently. If you don't live differently, if you don't live self-sacrificially, if you don't live in the way that a person would live if they actually believed that the Son of God died for you, then maybe you don't believe. And so when we're talking about faith, you know, we know that the Scripture says, okay, you're saved by faith. But when we say, I'm saved by faith, the question is, are you saved by faith? In other words, do you believe in such a way that you show that you believe? I mean, the example I use, I always like to use it because this is, clears it up. Um, imagine if somebody, you know, puts a tightrope across Niagara Falls and they say, this is, this is in the book, right? I don't know where I got this from. But if, it, if somebody puts a tightrope across Niagara Falls and... Uh, I think some guy named Charles Blondin, some French high wire artist did this like around, you know, 1890 or something like that. But so you put a high wire rope across Niagara Falls and there's a crowd and you're pushing a wheelbarrow back and forth across and people like in awe. And then you say to the crowd, do you believe that I could push this wheelbarrow across with a 200 pound weight in it? And everybody's like, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I believe. I believe. And, and you're like, you're sure? Yes, we believe you could do that. And he says, okay, you get in the wheelbarrow. Now you'll know if you believe it or don't. Because it's easy to say, I believe. It's easy to say, I believe Jesus rose from the dead, and I believe all that stuff. Okay. Are you, you going to live it? You're going to risk your life on it? You're going to base your life on it? When you're forced to do that, then you find out, do you actually believe? And something has happened in the American church, which is, it would happen in the German church, but it's happened in the American church where faith has become super cheap. Like, you could be living in sin, what everybody says, yeah, but I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. I believe. It's like, I don't know that you do, because you wouldn't live that way. You wouldn't, you, you, you know. And so, in a way, we have divorced faith from action. And Bonhoeffer always talked about faith in action. In other words, you've got to live out your faith. In fact, the whole reason you get saved it's like, it's not to go to heaven, because then you would be translated the second you say the sinner's prayer, I'm in. It, we're still here. Most of us are still here. If you're still here, raise your hand. I just want to see, anybody still here? You're still here. So if we're still here, why are we here? We're here to now live out our faith until the Lord calls us to be with him. And some people think, well, that's, there's only one thing that I can do would be evangelism. That's the only thing I can do. And it's like, that's not biblical. The Lord calls us to all kinds of stuff to live out our faith, to, to free the captives. To, to Wilberforce ended the slave trade. Abolitionists ended slavery in America. Um, people live out their faith. We're supposed to live out our faith. Our, our faith, once you actually believe, you begin living in heaven that moment, right? Because we're seated with him in heavenly places while we're here. So we're supposed to be, even while we're here, we're there, and we're supposed to live out that heavenly life now. And so if that's not happening, then you kind of think, well, what is it? It's all about like some cerebral, like I say I believe this and this and this and that's it, I'm done. It's an intellectual thing. It has to be faith in action. And I believe a lot of our problems as an American church today uh, have to do with the fact that we've, we've missed that. And, and I just have to blurt out the thesis of the book, Letter to the American Church, the reason I wrote it is because 
I, what I say is that the silence of the church in Germany in the 30s, while Hitler was rising to power, they had an opportunity to speak boldly and maybe they would have died, maybe they would have gone to con concentration camps, maybe they, but, but Bonhoeffer was making the case of them that you need to speak up for the Jews, you need to speak against with the Nazis, you need to speak. And they said, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Not, we, don't, we don't know if we want to, we don't know if we're called to that. We want to stay in our lane, Romans 13, we want to get political, we're not gonna. So the silence of the German church led to the satanic evil of the Nazis and the Holocaust and on and on and on. And my thesis in the book is that the silence of the church in America today on a host of issues has opened the door in exactly the same way to the triumph of evil in our time. That, that's the hot button, to, hot button topic we want to talk about. But before we get there, you started addressing something else that you addressed in the book, which was called the idolatry of evangelism. I think you devoted an entire chapter to it. I think for all of us, we would agree the gospel's central. We, we want to proclaim the gospel that Christ died for sinners, that he rose from the dead. What is the idolatry of evangelism? Yeah, I thought that would, be, that would get people's attention to have a title chapter, uh, chapter title, the idol of evangelism, right? Because... I mean, you think about it. If you're Satan, you're clever, right? You're, you're not going to, you know, be able to lure people into everybody into to, to doing crack and murdering people. You, you, you have to be more subtle, right? So you say, let, let me, so let's take a good thing and get them to worship that good thing rather than God. And that can be anything, right? That could be your love for your family. We all understand this, right? That any, any disordered love or any good thing can be an idol which takes you away from God. So what I've seen in the American evangelical church is we take this thing, we call it evangelism, which of course is one of the greatest things imaginable, right? But we almost act like that's the only thing that's good. And so if I were to say anything that you might disagree with, that might push you away, that could risk my evangelistic efforts. So I will never say anything that might be perceived as controversial. Uh, like the idea that a human being in the womb uh, should not be killed. Uh, like slavery is wrong. Today we think, oh, slavery is wrong. Everybody knows slavery is wrong. Well, let me tell you, in the 1840s, 50s, a lot of pastors were silent on that issue. Because they said, well, we don't want to lose any of our congregation. There's a difference of opinion here. Now, today, we say, what cowards, what pigs, that they did not speak against slavery, one of the most satanic things imaginable. But in that day, they said, well, it's all about evangelism. We just want to, you know, we just, we're just about preaching the gospel, quote, unquote. It's like, well, God gave you a responsibility to speak truth and, and to, to speak against evil. And you didn't do that. Well, in Germany, Bonhoeffer said to the German church that unless you speak up for the Jews now, you have no right to worship God and sing hymns. God asks you, the church, you're supposed to believe Jesus defeated death on the cross. So you're not supposed to fear death. You're supposed to live out the faith. I don't fear death and I'm going to speak truth. And we need to speak up for the Jews. If you really, really, really believe in Jesus and what he did, you would do that, and some did. But most said, no, we're not gonna, we don't wanna stick our necks out. We don't believe in God that much. So when you're silent, because you, you, what's the excuse that they gave in the German church? They said, well, we just, we just wanna preach the gospel. We don't wanna talk about anything controversial like the Jews or anything political, or whatever. And it's been my perception that in the American church, that's happened, basically. We, we, as evil has arisen, we've said, well, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna be the one to speak about that from the pulpit, or I don't wanna be political, or I don't wanna, you know, because I could conceivably offend somebody and lose them. And I, I mean, I get that. Like, we, we all get that as a concept. You have to have wisdom and discernment. But this has really led to 
Christian leaders only quote unquote preaching the gospel, which becomes meaningless because, you know, if somebody's being raped and killed over there and you say, but let's just pray. Right. Because we all agree like prayer is great. But like, but what kind of a human being are you if you don't leap up to deal with that evil over there? And so I, I feel like the most wicked excuse is a pious excuse. Right. So if you're not speaking about things that are happening in the culture and, and you all know what they are, it could be anything. Right. It could be critical race theory, which is atheist, Marxist lunacy. It could be transgender lunacy it could be it could be any of these things which are harming actual people okay the marxism that's that's taking over whether it's actual marxism or cultural marxism or whatever you see happening in america especially that you know is hurting people but you say but i don't want to talk about that because that's controversial and i think god calls his church to speak to these things but Many, many Christians, they give a very quick answer that, no, 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 it's just about the gospel. I'm just supposed to preach the gospel. And I feel like, wh what kind of dead gospel do you think you're preaching if you don't speak about that evil and that evil and that evil and that evil? Who, who, who's going to listen to your gospel? Because I, it, wouldn't have, it doesn't appear, when you speak boldly on this stuff, there are lots of good pagans that are like, thank you. Because I'm trying to raise kids in this environment. I, I was wondering if anybody had the boldness to speak about that. You have obviously really believe in God. Like, that's a God that maybe I could believe in because I see that you're courageous. But if you're so, you know, if your faith is so thin that you don't ever actually act boldly or bravely or courageously or self-sacrificially, tons of people are looking at you and thinking, whatever you have, like, I'm not that interested in what you have. And so if you actually ironically care about evangelism, you're going to say things that some people will think of as controversial. And that will draw some people to you. And it may draw, draw some people, push some people away. But, but by God's grace, they can come back. If all you worry about is that I offended somebody. I mean, I remember as a non-believer being offended by what a Christian said. I got over it, didn't I? But somehow we kind of act like, well, I can't, I can't ever say anything controversial. And I just want to say that's not biblical. It's simply not biblical. And sometimes that means we speak politically. And people say, well, you can't be political. It can't be political. And I think that's not even biblical. Where would you get that idea? We're talking about truth and lies. We're talking about good and evil. And if you want to kind of label it political, you're just labeling it political because you don't like what I just said. So, so address this too, because this is what I want to get into. Um, we were talking earlier before we came up here. Um, talk about where the idea, notion of Christian nationalism came from. What did you say? The pit of hell. Okay, so. <laughs> you want me to be more specific? <laughs> uh, but, so, so as, a, as a preacher, it's called to preach the word. I mean, one of the things I enjoyed about your book was, I love the gospel. Champion the gospel. Our church loves the gospel. We champion the gospel. But we're called to do more than just not offend people so that they can get into the kingdom. Because you can't get through Genesis chapter 1 in preaching the truth without offending people, right? I mean, there's just, there's one race, there's two genders, there's six days, and everybody's offended. Because God is on his throne, right? So, yeah, don't tell them about that part. Um, so talk about just this. Just about the happy stuff. Try to suck them in. So in, in 2020, when everything began to change, and it's, it's, a, it's a radical movement in our culture, and people will say, well, pastor, you're being too political. You're talking about too many yeah. political issues. I'm leaving brave because you're politicizing the gospel. Speak to that. Well, I mean, I think um, we have to be clear, right? Like uh, in the book, uh, a lot of the people who I think are getting this wrong are good people. I want to say that, right? These are not like evil people. I mean, some of them might be, but most of the ones... Are, are either misguided or they, 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 they're not seeing something. And one of my favorite people in the world is Pastor Tim Keller, right? He wrote the foreword to my Bonhoeffer book, and he always would preach, um, you know, this is kind of a conservative view, and this is kind of a liberal view, and this is the gospel view, right? And it was kind of a nice template, and it worked, right? But he really was talking about, this is kind of like the pharisaical, law-based view, performance-based, you know, conservative, like, be good, uh, 
and then this is the liberal view, which says it doesn't matter if you're good or bad, like nothing matters or whatever. And in the middle is the gospel, right? And it's a beautiful idea, but it became kind of this mantra. And over the years, our culture has changed. And so when you used to be able to say like, well, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican or, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the main Democrat was like Tip O'Neill. <laughs> Only the older people are laughing. Okay, you young people who didn't get that, you're ignorant, okay? You need to look up Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House. But my point is that the differences between the parties were really n nothing compared to what they are now. You didn't have full-blown Marxism trying to take over or transgender madness or authoritarian big state government, which is right out of China. Like, that... that was unthinkable to any Democrat up until 10 minutes ago, uh, you know, up, up, up until, you know, let's say 10, 15 years ago. It was unthinkable. And now it's here. And so now when you say, well, you can't be political, you're like, excuse me, the problem is that over here we're dealing with, like, Marxism and atheism, and, and it doesn't... I mean, Bill Clinton, which, you know, if you're older, it's like five minutes ago, he famously said, we need abortion to be safe legal and rare, okay? So he wanted abortion to be legal, but he, he was willing to say, like, it needs to be rare. It's not a good thing. They were, th there were many... I mean, all Democrats would have said that. Any politician would have said that. But in the Democratic Party, there were many pro-life Democrats. That's no longer the case. Now you have people sickeningly celebrating their abortion. And, and the division has become so dramatic. So when somebody says, don't be political, I'm thinking, are you kidding? Like, it's, not, it's no longer possible. If I'm, a, if I'm against drag queen story hour, you're going to say, like, I'm being political. And so I, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of pastors have really foolishly said, well, we're not going to touch on any of those controversial things, acting just kind of like, well, we've got this corporation here, and we don't want to, like, screw up the numbers, you know? And you think that's not, that's not being a prophetic voice of the church. To, tr to really trust the Lord is to say what God says. You're going to say it lovingly, but you're going to say it. And if you don't say it, people's lives are going to be destroyed. If you're silent about what is God's sexual ethic, what is the biblical ethic that God has on sexuality... It's between a man and a woman in marriage, right? Now, why do you say that? You say it, first of all, because the Bible says it, but you also say it because that will bless people. That's right. You will bless people. And if you don't say it, you will hurt people. So we have an obligation as Christians to speak the truth. Now, this doesn't mean every second, but the point is that it's become really fashionable for people to say, oh, you're being, you're being political. And I think... You, don't you think that if I spoke against slavery in the 1850s that tons of people would said, oh, you're being political? They said, to, by the way, they said to William Wilberforce, who I write about in, in the book. I mean, I wrote a biography about him, but he's the man that led the battle against the slave trade because of his Christian faith. And he was told in his time by many people, keep your faith out of politics. You have no right mixing faith and politics. And I think we all know that we're thrilled that he brought Jesus into politics and abolished this abomination called the slave trade, right? But in his day, people tried to shut him up and said, you're being political, you're being political. And whether it's Bonhoeffer or anybody, it's a way to shut people up. And even the idea that we're not supposed to be political, I, I, I guess the more I looked at it, the more I just rejected it. Like, it's just meaningless. We're supposed to speak truth. And I mean, if, if, if Joseph Stalin... Is, is a candidate, and then there's another candidate. Are you telling me from the pulpit I can't say, vote for this guy? Are you telling me, oh, I, you, you can't be political? And it's like, well, I disagree. I, I, I think in that, in that case, God commands me to be political if, if, if that is happening. And, and so I just feel like we've kind of bought into this idea, and everybody's bought into it without thinking about it, and it's simply not... A biblical idea. It doesn't mean you're supposed to be a fire-breathing, you know, political speaker from the pulpit every Sunday, but this idea that somehow 
you can't be political. I mean, it, it, it just simply makes no sense. There's good and there's evil, and, and, and we're going to speak about certain things. Some people will disagree. Some people will be offended. But it's, it's happened so long that we're basically here now. And what I basically say in the book is that the reason we're here now with, with the world clearly going to hell at the speed of light, it's kind of obvious if anybody's paying attention, like things have gone out of control. It's, I say, it's because of the silence of the American church. If the American church had been speaking, and I, I wrote the book because I actually believe the Lord, it's his will that we turn it around. It's his will that those who can be persuaded, who have been silent, would understand that they have an obligation to speak. And if they speak, the Lord will bless. And if they're silent, we will go the way of Germany in the 30s, which is basically where we're going now. And I think the, this is the Lord's mercy to us to wake us up. Yeah, so talk a little bit about that, because we were talking before. I mean, you're, you're not a gloom and doom guy at your heart. You really believe that the Lord can bring revival. You believe that things can change. You believe the Holy Spirit still just as active today as he's always been. But in your research... Uh, about the German church in the 1930s. I want to talk a little bit about some of the comparisons and contrasts to today. As I told you before, my grandfather was born a full-blooded Jew in Nuremberg in 1923, got out in 1936, met his parents in New York City, 1937, and then the rest of the family never really heard of again, extended family never heard of again, assuming they were killed in concentration camps, and then just growing up, meeting concentration camp survivors that would have the tattoos on their arms. So I did all of my research papers growing up on the Holocaust. So I'm somewhat familiar, not as studied in it as you are from what was going on in the church. But it is fascinating to me how many evangelical pastors, you talked about some of your friends. Um, I'm asking two questions here. How much has it cost you to step up and say the things that you've said? And why is it important that as evangelical pastors in our generation, that the culture is different than it was in 1980 or 1990, and that the things that we should be talking about are different today than what they were. Um, what, what's the urgency of the hour? Well, first of all, you know, if, if your faith isn't costing you something, you might not have faith. Like, we got to think about that, Right. Like the Lord calls us, it's not just like about, oh, Bonhoeffer, he's awesome, he's brave, so-and-so, they're brave, so-and-so, they're brave. What about me? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not Bonhoeffer, I'm not Wilberforce, but we're all called by the Lord to live out our faith in our spheres. And it's always going to be different. You know, some, some people are going to be political, some people are going to be this, some people, are, you know, we, we're all different. But we're all supposed to, this is biblical, live out our faith, and agape love, the love of God, is by definition self-sacrifice, right? You sacrifice yourself to bless someone else. That's called loving someone. So you can love your neighbor, you can love your family, you can love your enemies. You sacrifice something for someone else because you say that's what God did, that's what God does, and he has deputized me to do that in my life. And so we've gotten so blessed and so comfortable that we... Kind of act like, well, I can be a Christian without really doing much of that. And that's not biblical. And it is, it's a damnable doctrine. It's horrifying that we've kind of gotten that comfortable. And so we all need to be like leaning into our faith. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, working out with, with weights, right? Like, like the more you tear your muscle, the more it will build up and you'll get stronger. And that's what the Lord wants us to do with our souls, right? He wants us to lean on him and, and need him. In other words, to, to live by faith is to require God to act, to put ourselves in these difficult situations. And when you put yourself in these difficult situations, whatever it is, I'm just saying, you know, you, you grow. And the Lord wants us to grow spiritually. And if you don't do that, if you're just kind of comfortable, you don't grow, which is gross. It's like it's wrong. It's not God's will. And so I really think that we've kind of adopted this model on some level that I don't really ever need to do anything, really live out my faith. And, and, and it's, it's led us to where we are. But to answer what I think was your second question is that, you know, this drift has been going on and on and on. And I think uh, when, 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 you, when you talk about, like, you know, Abortion was made legal in 1973. Okay, well, people still basically knew it was a bad thing. 
But something happened in the culture. And, and that's not just with that. But, I mean, we've all heard this. You know, we took God out of the schools, whatever, whatever, whatever. The, the bottom line is we've become increasingly secular. And the church hasn't really risen to it. Um, and so we are now at a place where, like, tremendous godlessness is shaking its fist at God in, in, in every way. I mean, even the idea that you say, well, I'm, nobody's going to tell me who I am or what I am. I could be anything I want, you know. So I could be a woman tomorrow if I decide to be, I guess. Uh, or I could, we all know that's preposterous. We just know that's not true. But are you willing to say it? Are you willing to live it out? Now, this is not, again, there, there are some very confused people, and our hearts have to break for them, we, right? It's not funny. It's, like, sad. At the same time, if somebody says, I'm Napoleon, I'm Jesus Christ, you don't bless them by saying, well, nice to meet you, Napoleon, nice to meet you, Jesus. You don't, you don't really bless them by going along with that lunacy. If you really love that person, you would, you, you, you would find a way to help them. You want to help them. And so if you're a girl who thinks you're a boy, you, you, you want you at least the church, at least the church, to say, we, we, we don't want to affirm you in that. We want to affirm you in, in the, who the Lord made you to be. But we're not going to participate in your self-destruction because that, that is to curse you. That's not to love you. And we are now at a place where it's become dramatic. It's so dramatic. And so I really do think that what we're going through right now is the Lord's mercy to wake up the church, because I really do believe that exactly what happened to the German church is what's happening to us. The only difference is we have the example of the German church as a warning to us, and that the Lord wants to say, okay, you see what happened here. This will happen to you without any doubt, unless you repent. There's no doubt about it. And so I think... I, I think we're, 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 we're seeing that now, and I think in some ways it probably has to still get worse before some people will wake up. But I also believe that people are waking up and that it's the Lord's will that his church wake up. Amen. Amen. I would like to talk to the young people a little bit too because, I mean, when you read the book and you're familiar with what happened in Germany, you hear the word Hitler, it's synonymous with evil. But going into what he did, there were a lot of pastors at the time that were wanting to support him, help him, um, come alongside of him. You even call um, sharing the gospel with him. Some, there was a pastor yeah. that wanted to do it. You call it running a fool's errand. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that? But I also want you to talk to the young people about this. I think, you know, in the schools today, um, a lot of young people are being taught just, um, you know, when they have friends that are identifying as homosexual or lesbian or trans or whatever, just love them. It's okay. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of people say things like this. If God's sovereign, it's going to work out the way it does. And by the way, in China, where the persecuted church is, it's booming. If that's what happens here, it happens here. Yeah. Let's just let it happen. Yeah. Speak to the, the, the lunacy of the passivity of just sitting around and waiting for bad things to happen. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, if, um, you know, if somebody's gay, okay, you know, you, 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 I would say this. A church has to be clear about what God says about that. But in every relationship... We're, we're clear here. What's that? We're clear. You're clear here. All right. But, but it doesn't mean that if I'm working someplace and there's somebody gay that I need to get in their face and saying, like, what you're doing is wrong or whatever. Like, no, no. Uh, any more than everyone you know, you know, who is having sex as a marriage, you need to confront them or whatever. I mean, you have to have wisdom. So it's not, it's not about that. But it's about knowing the truth and not pretending like, mm, who's to say? Well, look... God gives us these things to bless us, to bless us. And, and we, we, we have to be clear about it. Um, but in terms of God's sovereignty, I mean, the idea, you know, the scripture says all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. So this idea that, well, everything just kind of works out in the end is completely unbiblical. Like, if somebody is being, you know, as I said, raped or murdered, and I say, well, who's to say if I should interfere? Maybe God's working out his plan. That is anti-biblical. That is karma, right? That's, if, that's what Eastern religion is. Eastern religion says if somebody's in the gutter, they deserve to be there. Don't help them. Don't mess up. They're working out their karma, right? 
So that's the opposite of the Christian ethic. The biblical ethic says we help the poor. We help those who are sick. We do those things. God calls us to do those things. He made us to do that. And the, the, Eastern religion, the, the view of Eastern religion says, no, 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 that's their karma. So like if you're poor, you deserve to be poor. I don't want to figure out how to help you. Um, if you're suffering, if you're miserable, that's just, that's just part of, you know. So they wouldn't say it, but some Christians have adopted it. Well, that's, that's just God's sovereignty. I don't want to do anything about it. And you think, that's not biblical. And so the only question is, you know, if, if I see somebody suffering or somebody poor, the question is not, do I help them? The only question is, how do I help them? Now, some people would say, well, you help them by giving a lot of taxes to the government and the government will help them. And I would say, no, that's actually going to hurt them. But if it worked, I would say, great, but it does not work. We have many, many decades to show that it doesn't work. So if you want to harm the poor, you vote for big government socialism and you harm the poor. Um, so the question is, how do you help the poor? Um, so that's complicated, but the point is there's some people who say, well, we just, we don't care. We don't care about the poor. That a biblical view, of course, we care about the poor. So this idea of some, fa it's really fatalism that says like, I don't need to do anything. It's all, you know, it's all in God's hands or whatever. That is nonsense. The Lord, reason you're still here is because the Lord has work for you to do. And we're supposed to, to, to do his work. We're, we are him doing that work. He's given us by, by his Holy Spirit. And there's just one other thing that I wanted to say now. Of course, I forgot. Uh, It'll, it'll come to me. But uh, we're, we're com we're, God wants us to live out our... Fa oh, I know what I was going to say. It was that, that kind of fatalistic idea. There are a lot of Christians. They're like the most pious Christians, right? They're kind of like, oh, we're under judgment. It's over. In other words, they will not get off their rear to do anything because they have determined... America deserves judgment. All these babies have died. It's over. So I'm going to sit on my rear end. I'm going to watch Fox News. I'm going to get some Slim Jims and, you know, go into the root cellar and wait till Jesus returns because I'm not really, like, there's nothing to be done. And that attitude contributes to the horror of where we are because they're not fighting. They're saying it's over. You don't get to decide it's over. You get to fight until the Lord says it's over. It's really good. It's really good. Talk about this. You, you'd said in the book, too, just how often we as Christians, we will take a religious principle, and then we just want to be good. And you use the example in your book, I believe, as far as what would you do uh, if you were kind of an Oscar Schindler or somebody that was hiding Jews and a Nazi knocked on your door and said, are you hiding Jews here? And notice how it's, relig it's religiosity. Well, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, okay. It's, so talk about that. I mean, because I think we've been trained so much. Yeah. Rather than doing the highest good, right. we've gotten trained into principles just right. to passively get by. Speak right. to that. Well, in other words, it all depends on how you see God, right? If you see God as a killjoy, as somebody who's just looking to find your sin so he can whack you, you realize that's the devil. That's not God, Right? God loves you, and God wants to bless you. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care if you sin, but the point is that he it's because he loves you that he cares. So if you have a negative fear-based view of God, all you're going to care about is avoiding sin. All you care about is your salvation, like I don't want to do anything wrong. What do I need to do? And what other people are thinking about me. And what, well, what other people are thinking about me. So your thinking is basically like God's the enemy, and I just got to figure out a way to do this and this and this and this and this so I can get into heaven. And what that does is it makes you pietistic in a sense that, to use the example, the Gestapo comes to your door and says, are you hiding a Jew in your cellar? And God's heart would say that I care about the Jew. So I'm going to say to the Gestapo person, Oh, no, I'm not hiding a Jew uh, in, in the cellar. In other words, I'm going to lie, quote, unquote, right? This is not like a biblical lie, but I'm, I'm going to say that just like Rahab did, just like other, because I actually care about what God's heart is to save the Jewish person. But if you don't really care about the Jewish person 
And if you think God is just a moral scorekeeper, then you're going to say, oh, I cannot tell a lie, Mr. Gestapo. Please come in and help yourself to torture and kill the Jew. And that way I'm justified before the fake God that I worship. Now, that is so ugly because it's religiosity. In other words, what could be more wicked than, than having this religious reason for turning the Jew over to the Gestapo? But there are a lot of people that have that kind of a view of God. That they, they, all they care about is not making a mistake. I'll give you an example that'll hit home. I know many people that said, I don't like that candidate. He's vulgar, he's mean, and I don't care that much if Roe v. Wade gets overturned and lives get saved. or I don't care that much about that. What I care is about that if I were to vote for that guy, people might think less of me. And I think that's heavy. That's pretty heavy because that's basically what many people have said. I got an email the other day through my website, somebody saying like, you know, literally anyone would be better than, you know, Donald Trump or something. And I thought, you've clearly lost your mind because even if you don't like him, I mean, I don't care if you hate him, you can hate him, it's a free country, but the point is, lives will be affected by how you vote. And God will hold you responsible for why you do what you do. And if people suffer, if the poor suffer, if inflation goes up, if, if we have nuclear war, if we, whatever it is, we're self-governing people. We get to pick our leaders. And if you really don't care about your neighbor, all you care about is what people might think because I voted for the vulgar guy who's on his third wife. That's really what you're worried about. Folks, people's lives are at stake. Our, our, our civilization is at stake. America is at stake. But if you're so pious, and believe me, I know many Christians and I've lost friends over this, who are so pious, they can't imagine how you could vote for that guy. And I'm not here to tell you like, you know, b because I, I voted for Trump or, or because I, I like him as a candidate, I haven't changed my position on like adultery, for example, okay? I'd be like, yeah, I'm all in, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I'm a Christian. My views haven't changed on any of that stuff. But it's because of my Christian views that I say, if you actually care about the poor, you can't vote for that unbelievably corrupt Democrat. You didn't fill in the blank. I mean, whether it's Hillary Clinton or whatever. But it doesn't mean, you know, again, that there was a time, you know, I remember Joe Lieberman, was an incredibly principled, wonderful man. Uh, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. I mean, there have been many Democrats that are just wonderful. So it's not about that. It's about the reality of it. So if I'm given a, a clear choice between madness and corruption and somebody who I think might actually care or do a good job or appoint originalists, constitutionalists, uh, originalists to the Supreme Court, I'm going to, I feel, I mean, I feel at that point, I feel I have a moral obligation to hold my nose and vote for the mean guy because it's not about that. It's about the results. And, and listen, I'll be clear. William Wilberforce worked in, in um, I, I've never said this before in any of these forums or when I talk about this book, but I, it just occurred to me that William Wilberforce, because he cared about the African slaves, because he knew God called him to care about these strangers that he would never meet, these African slaves, he worked in parliament with some of the foulest people imaginable. And I mentioned them in my Wilberforce book, Amazing Grace. I mentioned it. I think it was James Fox is the number one. Completely immoral creep. You know, makes, makes Trump look like Pence. <laughs> so Wilberforce said, I will do business with that guy, even though I know his life is disgusting, like really disgusting. But I will do business with him if it will help my legislation, which will help end the slave trade. And 
a really pietistic person, a religious person would say, oh, I would never do that. I would never break bread with that dirty person. And let the slaves rot. Who cares about the slaves? Right? Let, let the Jews rot. Who cares about the Jews? I just want to worry about my, you know, my bona fides. You know, I want to look good. I want to look like a religious Christian. Well, I'll tell you what, that doesn't fool God. God looks on the heart. So we're kind of stuck. We're, we're going to open it up for questions here in just a minute, but one more thing, and I've heard you address this. I think it's important for our congregation uh, that's gathered here tonight to hear this. What, what about when I disagree with things, and I want to talk about that, and people say, you can't talk about that. When, when what I want to talk about goes against the grain, such as mandated vaccines, such as a stolen election, such yeah. as all these different things, and people will say, well, you're a pastor, well, no, or, but that's we actually, can't talk about but that's that. But that's actually what has made me more vocal, right? Okay, talk about that. No, no, the, the reason I say this is because, like, when somebody says, you can't talk about that, I, I just think, like, what, excuse, excuse me, I'm going to, I live in America. People... Like, people literally died. People literally died on battlefields so that we could have the freedom to speak. And even if I, if I say something stupid or wrong, I have the right in America to, to speak. And so when you tell me you can't talk about that, you'll get canceled if you talk about that. Right there, I go, okay, I'm going to shout about that. Because... There's something deeply vile about that cancel culture, and I, you know, it, it really is vile. It's it's fundamentally anti-American. It's anti-biblical. Okay, so when it comes to issues like the vaccine or the election fraud or those things, I mean, I firmly believe that the vaccines are a horrible idea and have caused tremendous harms. Whatever, I believe that. Okay, and. And, and I believe the election w was stolen. I mean, I generally believe that, right? Now, the point is, you don't have to agree with me, but when you tell me you can't talk about that, then I go, oh, you're afraid of me talking about that. And so now I'm really going to talk about it because that is where we are now. Look, you've all, we've all lived our lives, and we all know how some people how they play that game, right? They just kind of threaten you. Like they play nice until they realize that that's not going to work. So now I'll threaten you. You'll lose your job. You'll, you'll lose your social platform. You'll lose this. You'll lose that. When they're threatening you, now you know you are right. Because they wouldn't resort to that if they had a point. They wouldn't play that game. And so I feel like no one should be braver than Christians on that issue. We should say, I'm going to trust God with my job with my finances, if I'm a pastor, with my congregation, with the numbers, whatever. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. We get to live out our faith. We get to live out our faith and see what God's going to do. But if you don't really believe in God, you're like, well, I don't know. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk it. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get by. And that's a tragedy because we're not here that long. The older you get, the more you realize we're not here that long. I only get to, to like live out my faith for a little bit. And these are opportunities for us to live out our faith and to see God move if God is real. But if you're not so sure that he's real, then you kind of hedge your bets and just do whatever you need to do. And so, I mean, I, my, my radio program was getting bigger and bigger and bigger on YouTube. YouTube completely wiped it out. Now, that was a huge financial hit. And believe me, you know, I'm a writer. People maybe think because I'm wearing this jacket that I have a few bucks. I, we don't. Uh, we rent an apartment, you know, in New York City, and uh, uh, I own a 10-year-old car, and, you know, we're living our lives and stuff, but so, like, people say, well, what price have you paid? Well, we got wiped out of, on YouTube. Now, why? Why? What did I say that was so offensive? I had on a guest who talked about vaccine mandates and a couple of other things like that, but I wasn't trying to be provocative, but they were so threatened that they completely wiped out what we had built over years, right? Um, I had on another guest who talked about the voting machines and stuff, and I was not like hitting this stuff every day, but I had on a guest, and as a result of that, I got sued and been having to pay lawyers and, and all this different stuff. And I think, okay, we know 
that millions of Christians have lost their lives for their faith in Jesus. So we can't lose a little bit. We don't trust God with that. And by the way, even if, and, and even if you lose your life, can I tell you a secret? Like, when they kill you, you don't die. Amen. Like, we need to... I really think the Lord is calling... I think he's waking up his church to live out our faith. To live out our faith. We've been able to kind of sleepwalk over, you know, through the prosperity and everything's cool. But, like, when the pressure comes, your, your faith comes alive. And, and, I, and I really do believe that we have an opportunity right now to live out our faith and to be the church... And to do things in our generation that, that we wouldn't be able to do if everything had gone the way we might have wanted. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the Apostle Paul tells us he's been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Uh, in the book of Philippians, he says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to have uh, John, if you go... Pastor John, if you go stand there. Pastor Drew, if you go stand there. If you want to begin to form lines, we're going to take some questions here after uh, I ask uh, Eric this question. And... Um, you can ask whatever you want. Any, but, any questions. But as keep, long as it's keep true it short because we want to get through as many questions as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, but one of the questions that came up was, and you've talked about wisdom. You've talked about not worrying about dying. But what are practical steps day to day? You know, we're not doing a conference like this or anything. And just how do I just live out my life here in Denver, Colorado, believing what I believe, uh, living it day to day in my neighborhood, in my school, in my church, how do I live this out? Well, I mean, there's, there's no answer and there's a million answers to that. The first thing I would say um, is that if somebody can be persuaded, you want to persuade them, right? So, so part of the reason I wrote this book is that there are pastors that need a shot in the arm to say, like, you know what? I have been guilty of being silent. I need to speak up, you know? So if you, if you know of a pastor like that, they can be persuaded. But if they're not persuaded and if they continue keeping silent... Please leave that church. Please find a church like this one. And they're around the country. There are heroic pastors living out their faith. All those churches where they're being like political are growing because normal people see the madness and they're looking for hope and they're looking for answers. It's like, it's kind of basic. And so I, I really think being part of a healthy church community or being around people who will encourage you so that wherever you are in your, in your life, in school, and at work or whatever, you, you, you will walk around encouraged because you're walking with people that get it. We need that. You, you, to, be, to be doing any of this alone, it's too difficult. That's good. Well, hey, let's go to the questions. Uh, we'll start here with you, Pastor John. Uh, if you just ask your question quickly, we want to get through as many of these as we possibly can. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, great stuff. I think it's clear the left needs God. Um, my concern that keeps me speaking up would be their disregard for children. You know, they've brought in this really icky sexual stuff now, two, five, six, seven-year-olds, but they're not stopping there. I'm wondering if you kind of have an inclination, how far are they willing to go with our children on the left when it comes to the sexual stuff? I'm out of here for I mean, I'm not sure that I understand that question, but I guess my point is, I mean, let me, let me just say that people should be screaming and shouting and turning over tables over that issue. And the idea, I mean, you want to know how to love your pagan neighbor? Speak loudly on that issue because they're trying to raise their kids in the midst of this lunacy. And we are supposed to believe Jesus defeated death on the cross. We're not supposed to have fear. We're supposed to speak boldly. There is nothing more clear than that that is satanic. I mean, if, if you, if some adult, okay, my daughter's 23, but if some adult had come to her when she was a little kid and, like, spoken any of that stuff to her, it would be hard for me not to kill them and repent later. And the idea that anyone could possibly get, get away with this, I mean, I, I don't care if you have to, you know, educate your child in a cave, okay? You, no child should ever, ever be subjected to this. This is satanic. This is like, I mean, it's really, to ask a child what is his or her gender is satanic. It is no different than physical child abuse in terms of the horror of it. And I think we need to, you know, we need to be vocal about that and we need to just say, 
excuse me, like, I don't care if you think I'm crazy. You will never, as a teacher, ever bring up anything like that around my child or any child. And if you do, you will pay a price. I will be in your face. I will be, you know, I will take my kids out of school. But the point is, like, some things are just completely non-negotiable. And, and, and if you ever needed evidence that things have gone, like, crazy, I mean, because there's certain levels of evil, okay? That, to me, is like so it's it's satanic that there are people crazy enough to be pushing those ideas but then when people are silent about it or when people allow it you think well then you deserve what you get then the world really is going to hell because if they, if that doesn't move you to do something if it doesn't move you to anger the injustice of it the evil of it so that that is like that's a simple issue and and again most americans would agree with that you know, you're hearing these talking heads. Most average people know that that's evil. And so if Christians would speak up on that, they, they, the people will be cheering you. They'll be saying, like, where, where are you getting those ideas? Can I come to church with you? That's more likely than not, you know, so. That's one reason why we're starting Brave Academies. I am thrilled. That. Could you say something about when you were a younger man working with Chuck Colson and Breakpoint? Was that influential for you? How anything about that experience? Chuck Colson uh, was a, a hero of mine, and uh, eventually I went to work for him, and then he became a friend of mine. And I really loved him, and he's been a huge influence on me. In my book Seven Men, uh, the seventh man in my book Seven Men is Chuck Colson. Um, he was uh, an extraordinary, an extraordinary man. I write about him in this new book, Letter to the American Church. Um, because he understood all this stuff we're talking about. And he was trying to fight this 15 years ago. And some of, I actually mentioned some pastors by name in the book who weren't willing to go along with him for these really preposterous, religious, pietistic, theological reasons. And he was upset because these were friends of his who were not willing to be political. And he, he, he said, this is madness. And so I think that's kind of where we are today. But I, I adore Chuck Colson, and I, as I said, I write about him a little bit in this book. Awesome. Yeah, I really appreciated your talk tonight, so thank you for that. There's been issues throughout American history where it was somewhat controversial of what side of it you should be on. The Civil War, for example, being about states' rights, but also slavery, and like the alcohol ban. So I guess my question is, with the original intent of the Constitution being to keep government out of American lives, how do we maintain the integrity of the freedoms in the Constitution without losing ground in the church in voting issues like gay marriage, medical decisions, and marijuana, things like that? That's a very, that's a very complex question. <laughs> I, I really don't like complex questions. I want it to be really simple. Um, no, that's such a great question, and, and there's no real answer to it because it's, it's, that's part of what it is. I wrote a book called uh, If You Can Keep It about America. And it's, this is the, the ongoing dance of the American, thank you. Uh, but but in other words, it's the kind of ongoing dance of the American experiment. We have to keep working this stuff out, and sometimes we get it wrong. Prohibition, we got wrong, right? Um, Roe v. Wade, we got wrong. Like, we, we have to keep uh, working it because, uh, you know, there's always things that need fixing, and there's needs that, I mean, to me, like the greatest thing we could do when we talk about, you know, the, the authoritarian government, draining the swamp, like defunding like 70% of the government would be the, the most extraordinary way that we could regain our freedoms. And, and I think people get that, and I think that's why a lot of people are angry, because they're thinking like, whatever we have, we're not being represented well. And that's the only reason we're, so we have freedom is so that we can govern ourselves, and we, we increasingly find this, this, this uh, deep-rooted bureaucracy kind of governing. That's not America. And so, um, anyway, we want to get to more questions, but that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, what's your thoughts of setting up parallel economies to kind of defund the crazy? I didn't, I didn't just hear that. What's that? What's your thoughts about setting up parallel economies to kind of defund the crazy? being able to take the money oh, out of... Oh, yeah. Well, I, on my radio program, I've had a number of people on uh, to talk about this. And in other words, one of the ways that we... Uh, like we all, you know... I, 
there are some Christians who don't vote, right? I wouldn't say that they should be shot, but um, that's the minimum. Voting is like the minimum, right? You've got to be active in every other way. And I think part of what we're learning is that we've kind of like atrophied and acted like, well, I just need to be saved and like do whatever, pay my taxes and not, not commit any crimes. It's like, no, you need to be active as a citizen in all kinds of ways. And one of the main ways that we have power is how we spend our money. And so most of us, uh, every one of us, myself included, spend a lot of money with woke corporations, and it's kind of inevitable, but to the extent that you have a choice, make that choice. This is, I mean, I, I say all the time, you know, if you can buy something from Mike Lindell uh, and not from uh, Amazon or somebody else, you know, I, as long as you use the code Eric, thank you. Um, <laughs> But, but in, in all seriousness, when you have a choice, like pay the price, pay the extra dollar or whatever it is to make the right choice, to buy American or to buy from a company that doesn't support woke values. And I actually think that that's, that's part of waking up, the church waking up and realizing that I'm funding bad things. Now, you can drive yourself crazy, right? It, it, this doesn't mean that I will never buy something from Starbucks. But the point is that if I have a choice, I, I, I want to I take that choice. I want to do what I can. The same thing goes, uh, one of the sponsors on my program is Inspire Investing, Inspire Advisors. And they talk about how tons of people have uh, all your retirement funds invested with all kinds of wicked, wicked, wicked corporations. And he talks about how you can take your money out of there and put it in funds that are not supporting abortion or supporting these different kinds of things. So I, I actually think that that's really important that we kind of wake up to that and understand that we have tremendous power. When you think of the money of people with our values, if we would begin to shift that money to companies, reward companies that share those values, or even if they don't share the values, that they're not sneering at our values, you know? So anyway, yeah. That's good. So we have, we have a question from our, our Westminster campus from Adam. Apparently lots of people are asking about this one. So could you expound on Christian nationalism being from the pit of hell? Yeah. No, what, actually, I, don't, I didn't say that Christian nationalism is from the pit of hell. The concept of it is from the pit of hell. In other words, when people say, like, what about Christian nationalism? I'm thinking, like, that's what you got? Like, that's what you want to talk about? And, like, that's what you're worried about? That the Christians are going to gonna take over and oppress non-Christians? That's theocracy. I don't believe in it. It's, not, it's against the Constitution. It's unbiblical. And so this idea that there are all these people ginned up like that's the problem, Christian nationalism. It, it's, it's, I was someplace talking about this issue, and an old guy came up to me in the book line and said, like, well, would you renounce the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers? And I was like, well, like that, you're, you're really worried about them? Like they're like in your hood messing with you? What's going on? <laughs> like what, what, where's your focus? And, and, but there are people that they have to kind of invent these, you know, uh, chimeras, these phantoms, like that that's the problem. And I just think, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, uh, lo loving my country in a healthy way is a good thing. I am a Christian. Christian values are what ended the slave trade and slavery. Uh, Christian values bless a nation. But I can't impose those values, because if you impose those values, then you cease to be free. So we have to persuade, and we have to, you know, use the voting process and the political process. But whenever people kind of use the boogeyman of Christian nationalism, you know, it's kind of like the, it's when they say, you're being political. It's like as soon as somebody goes to the name calling, I'm out. Like I'm not going to cast pearls before swine and then play the game where uh, I'm going to argue with you. Because I don't think some people, they're really not interested in having a, a real argument, they're interested in just shutting you up. And I think Christian nationalism is a term that, you know, like theology majors like to throw around or something. But it, it, to me, it's, it's just preposterous to be arguing about it at this point. Hi. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate you coming and um, just standing up for everything we all agree with, um, especially Trump. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, my question is kind of twofold. Regarding the election that just happened, as you stated tonight, um, you believe that most Americans agree with us. So what are your thoughts on what happened this last Tuesday and how that came to be? 
And now that we know that Trump is running um, in 2024, what are your thoughts um, specifically on what should or could be done differently to, um, I mean, get him, you know, ha have that party um, have a better reputation, get them elected, I guess is my question. I didn't hear the last part to do that. What, what do you think needs to be done differently um, in 2024 now that we know oh, Trump is running yeah. to... to um, well, first of all, let me say clearly that I'm not really upset about what happened in the election. I'll tell you why. Because the corruption and the election fraud has to be revealed. And, the, and if we had just won and had a red wave, uh, we, would, we have to deal with that. Uh, there's just no question that uh, until people get angry and say, I know for a fact there is no way John Fetterman was actually elected. <laughs> like, like, is that, that's not crazy. That's like common sense, right? He can't string together a simple sentence. And so the fact is that there has been corruption in our politics for many decades. Everyone knows this. And so if you think it's funny or you think it's like, well, that's the way it is. I, I really don't want to talk to you because you don't care. My old parents like hauled their rear ends to the voting booth to go vote. And they, you know, my father uses a, a cane. There are people all around this country that believe their vote counts. For somebody to sneer at that, for somebody to say, well, corruption is just part of it. That is wicked, folks. That is a moral issue. And I honestly think that we know uh, it happened in Arizona. It happened, it happened in many, many places. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt. And I know that it happened in, in 2020. And, you know, when I say that, I think, like, I've talked to a lot of people, and I think that we must deal with it. And I really think that unless we deal with it, we want to move forward in a healthy way. And you can't move forward in a healthy way as a nation until you deal with that. And I really believe what just happened is, is, is forcing more Americans than believed in it before the election to say, you know what, we need to deal with this. And so there is more of a movement to deal with it. I really do believe that's, that is literally why Trump lost. Anybody, listen, it's as insane that John Fetterman was elected. It's, it's insane that Joe Biden was elected. Do you remember, do you remember his campaign? Do you remember? I mean, it, it, it's so crazy and I think sometimes you have to use common sense and say wait a minute folks this doesn't seem right but then when you look into the details it really doesn't seem right so we have to deal with that and we we start dealing with it by talking about it and saying like it looks to me like the election was stolen it looks to me like there's corruption right and then if you keep talking about it eventually things will begin to get done I think things will begin to get done as a result of this as far as Trump's candidacy I had the privilege uh, two days ago of being in the third row at Mar-a-Lago when he announced that he was running for and I mean I can't believe that I'm saying that that I had the privilege that was it was it was a God thing I'll be very honest with you that I got to be there I was wearing this shirt and this tie and um, and I um, and I I believe very firmly that he's the only person uh, equipped to deal with what we have in front of us. That's, that's what I believe. Uh, and I believe anybody that primaries him deserves the beating they will get. But it's a free country. They could, they could do that if they want. Hello. Uh, so first off, just want to say thanks for being here. Uh, I've been coming to Brave for three weeks, and it's fantastic so far. Um, um, so we've talked a lot about kind of how uh, the corruption in America currently, right? And it seems like the left has a hold on things, and it primarily has a hold on the Internet. And whenever you say speak up and do these things, you know, for example, we're talking about the election being rigged, but nothing's happened from this truth that you like present right if the election really was rigged why hasn't anything happened and uh you know i'm 25 years old 
and I look around and most of my peers seem to be brainwashed with this ideology, right? And the companies that own any outlet to speak have the power to remove your YouTube or your Instagram or no longer your Twitter, thanks to Elon. But, um, you know, they have the power to remove your voice and you're saying speak up. And I can speak up to my friends all I want, but I guess, you know, what exactly can you do moving forward as like a 25 year old man in a world where everyone's being silent or silenced for well, speaking I, up? I would say that, you know, we obviously everyone here agrees with, I mean, what you're saying is, is true, but I would say this, we're here now we're talking. Nobody's stopping us from talking. There are many people that wouldn't come to something like this because if you're, what's the point? We've already lost. We need to fight. We need to use what voice we have, what social media presence we have, what money we have, what uh, energy we have, what talents we have to fight. And I believe that God will give us the victory if we fight. And so when we talk about the election fraud, I mean, you know, I hear this over and over again that people say like, well, nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing's happening. It's like we have to keep trying and keep fighting. I mean, to give in to this wickedness is to participate in it, is to be guilty of being part of the wickedness. So we have to do what we can. And listen, you can't convince every friend. I've lost friends. There are people that I, I, I don't talk to anymore because I just think I don't want to waste my time and God's time just arguing, you know, beating my head against a brick wall. You have to take... You have to be wise in a sense, right? And, and so I think the first thing you want to do is be around people that can help you and encourage you in the way that you think. But I don't think we should lose hope. And I really think it's a sin for us to lose hope. We have to fight, fight, fight. And I, and I don't think nothing is being done. There's a lot of stuff because of the, you know, the fake news. You're not hearing about what's being done. Mike Lindell, who I keep mentioning, has been working tremendously uh, on this front. And there are others as well. But he has been working amazingly, uh, doing all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, there's a lot going on that you're not hearing about. We have to just all do what we can and just trust God that if we do our job, if we fight with everything we have, trusting the Lord, uh, he will give us the victory. And if he doesn't give us the victory, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant for fighting. Because, you know, it's... The results are in his hands, but we still have tremendous freedom and, 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 and abilities to do all kinds of stuff. And, and if we don't do those things, then we're guilty of making it happen. But I really do believe if we fight, listen, in the natural, we shouldn't have won the revolution in the natural. Um, but they kept fighting, kept fighting, kept fighting, and God miraculously gave them victories. You hear stories like this over and over again. In the natural, it's hopeless. Um, I would say that we have enough evidence to say that we need to fight with everything we have. And everybody's different. Everybody's working in different spheres. But definitely don't lose hope. I, I really believe that. Um, th I mean, I have a lot of reason to believe that things are happening. I see things happening. I am personally genuinely hopeful. Absolutely. With, I don't, I'm not just saying that. Yeah. 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 And I know um, during COVID, you had online prayer meetings all the time. We as a church, we pray. We have a 1,000 people that come out to our prayer meetings. We believe in the supernatural. We believe that God still moves, still does all that. Um, as we continue, I have a question from Rachel in Westminster. She'd like to have just a couple of examples of cultural Marxism in America. Where do you see that, and how is that similar to what was going on in Germany in the 1930s? Well, it's, it's really not similar to what was going on in Germany in the 30s. In, the, in Germany in the 30s... Uh, the problem was not cultural Marxism, which really had hardly been invented, but it was, you know, uh, let, let's put it this way. It, it doesn't matter, you know, if, if I'm walking uh, along a path, if I fall into the ditch on the left or on the right. I just don't want to fall into either ditch. And so, you know, Marxism uh, is, is, is one ditch. Uh, hy the hyper-nationalism of the Nazis was one ditch. Uh, but globalism uh, is another ditch. It, it really doesn't matter. And I think what we're facing now, I mean, when I say cultural Marxism, critical race theory uh, and a lot of this woke stuff is, it's cultural Marxism because basically the Marxists, first of all, it's fundamentally atheistic. It, it, there's, it has no uh, 
roots in the Bible whatsoever. If, if critical race use says it's against racism, I want to ask them, where do you get that from? Like, why are you against racism? Because if you don't believe in God, where do you even get the idea that we're all equal, that we should treat each other? Like, where do you even get that idea? I get that idea from the Bible. Where do you get it from? So they're just kind of blowing smoke, and they're using it to divide. And part of what is uh, interesting about cultural Marxism is that in the same way that economic Marxism used to divide, you know, the rich, uh, you know, the factory owners and the workers. Like, they, they you know would get the workers angry at the factory owners because, like, you're being oppressed, right? Well, you see the same thing now with groups. Like, if you're black or if you're a woman or if you're whatever marginalized group, you should be angry at the people who are not in your group. They're oppressing you. And you think, well, that's not a biblical ethic. I mean, if I'm a Christian, first of all, I'm supposed to love my enemies even if they are oppressing me, and I'm, and I'm not supposed to buy into this divided idea and, but there's something about cultural Marxism that wants to divide people, that wants to make us enemies. And, um, it, I mean, there's a lot more to it. I'm really uh, not doing it justice. But, but you, you, you kind of see it uh, in, in what we call woke, the woke stuff today, basically. Uh, and I'm not, I, I don't, there's so many other people standing and stuff, so I don't want to go too deeply into that. But it is really, I just use it kind of as a catch-all term because Marxism is, deeply atheistic, uh, and anything that's culturally Marxist, it's, it's atheistic. And so, again, the classic example is critical race theory. They are Marxist atheists talking about racism. I'm thinking, if you're a Marxist atheist, I don't even know how you get this idea that racism is bad. I know it's bad because I read the Bible. But where do you get your idea that it's bad? You're just kind of trying to get people angry at other people and trying to create, you know, problems. And actually, you're leading to more division and less healing and no healing. So, I mean, there's a lot to be said on that. Forgive me. That's a sloppy answer. That's good. We have time for two more questions. Let's go to Pastor John, then we'll come back to Pastor Drew. Uh, Eric, thank you for letter to the American Church. 1954, uh, majority of us here tonight were not even born yet, including me. Um, the... Uh, you mentioned in your book here that um, that was the year that uh, then-Senator Lyndon Johnson uh, introduced the amendment to the U.S. tax code prohibiting churches and any other nonprofit organizations from taking a public stand on political figures, the risk of uh, their tax exemption um, being repealed. Yeah. Uh, getting really practical here. If Jeff, I, I want to be bold as a lion. I want to be shrewd as a serpent. Yeah. But Jeff is going to be bold and in, in, in practically speaking, be speaking up the likes of what we're talking about. That's got huge implications for him, for us. Everyone here yeah. wants to be a faithful, generous you know, steward of our resources. Can you elaborate further on what happened then and, and what's transpired well, since it's pretty on this simple. subject? It's pretty simple. In, uh, in 1954, Lyndon Johnson, who was a skunk, in case you don't remember that. Uh, but I'm just saying, Lyndon Johnson, who you know, oversaw you know, the, the so-called Great Society, basically you know, created the welfare state. And, 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 and all the government handouts, whatever, which have crushed the poor in America for decades and decades, okay? But that's not the point. Johnson, in 1954, when he was a senator, came up with this amendment to say to churches, to get churches to shut up, because they were criticizing him, to, sh to get them to shut up, he basically put this amendment in to say that if you speak about any candidate or anything political, we'll take away your tax-exempt status. So it was a threat to the churches. And what did the churches do? Nothing. They let him get away with it. And so since then, everybody's like, oh, can't be political from the pulpit, can't be political from the pulpit. And you think, what, what do you tell, where do you get that idea from? I'm supposed to speak truth, okay? And if there is a candidate who believes in slavery, if there's a candidate who is openly racist, could we all agree that from the pulpit I can condemn that candidate? But you say, oh, that's political. Yes, it might be political, but the point is, I'm supposed to speak truth in my life, definitely from the pulpit. So the idea that churches just kind of meekly said, okay, well, well we don't want to lose our tax exempt status, so we're not going to... You should be daring the government to take away your tax exempt status. Like, you should be pushing... If every church would be pushing against that, you know, they don't have enough agents to take away your tax exempt status. Uh, but if you're silent for a little longer, maybe they'll get enough agents. 
Hi. So my brother is a college theater professor who was recently in a play as Bonhoeffer's brother. I was so excited. I told I him I'm I can't. I can't hear. It's, it's very tough up here. Say so, it again. Sorry. So um, my brother um, is a theater professor. A theater um, professor at college. Right. And he was in a play as Bonhoeffer's brother, and I was so excited because he and I don't really agree on anything, you know, religious or politically or anything. So I told him I was super excited. And he said that the only reason that he was passionate about being in the play and Bonhoeffer himself is because he's a pacifist and that he believes that that's what drove him to be and do what he did. Yeah. Um, can you speak to that? And do you think that's true? Bonhoeffer, um, this is like, you know, I was talking at the beginning of this about words, how words change, right? To be a pacifist, I mean, let's go back to World War I, right? In World War I, the great powers of Europe, like idiots, fought each other essentially over nothing. So they went to war. At, you're, you're applauding that? Uh, you're, but, it, no, uh, but so for Bonhoeffer in the 20s, in the 1920s, to say he was a pacifist, it meant that he's against kind of like the madness of hyper-nationalistic war. I mean, the French killing Germans and Germans killing French, if you look at it, it makes no sense. So he was a pacifist in that sense. Many people think he's a pacifist in the sense that John and Yoko were pacifists, right? <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, he was not that kind of a pacifist. But he's gotten that reputation, and part of my book, in, in, in my book on Bonhoeffer, I don't really go to great lengths, but I try to just tell the, the tr true story, and you just, you just see that he was not... What we, when we think of a pacifist, he was not that kind of a pacifist. He, he was not like, you know, a, a, a Hacksaw Ridge pacifist or... or he, was, he was not. It's just a fact that he was not. And, but, you know, because of, of his principled stand uh, against war of the kind that they had in the first war, people kind of got this idea from him. But, I mean, if you look at his life, it's, it just doesn't... It doesn't make sense. He doesn't, he doesn't write about that. He doesn't talk about that. He, he just didn't believe in that. He didn't even counsel his, uh, the young men that in, in the seminary, like, don't, don't go to war. A Christian can't uh, pick up a rifle. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't believe that. So uh, he was a good man, and he, like any Christian, was against unjust war. But uh, he, was, he was not a pacifist in, in that sense. Well, we are, we're so excited that you came out tonight. We, it's been a great night. Has this been a great night with Eric? Yep. It's great to have your voice here, your, your mind, uh, sharing what you're sharing across the country, sharing it with us. Uh, we're a church that loves the Lord. We're a church that loves the gospel. Uh, we're a church that wants to advance Christ's cause. We, we believe that we were born for such a time as this. It's the greatest generation we get to live in. Uh, so really appreciate that. I want you to know we're going to close with one song, just a song of hope, God of revival. During the singing of that song, uh, Eric will come out into the lobby. We'll form lines. He'd love to sign a book for you tonight. He'd love to meet you. love to say hello to you. And uh, we're so excited he's been here. So let me pray for Eric, pray for his ministry. And uh, if you join me in praying for him as we sing to the Lord. Father in heaven, thank you for Eric. Thank you for his willingness to be bold about truth and his love for you, Lord. Lord, his desire is to um, be used of you with his gifting for your glory. Lord, our time on this earth is short. And the older I get, the more I just agree with that. And Lord, we want to have the greatest possible kingdom impact that we can have for you. Lord, we want to see your Holy Spirit breathe through us and change this city, this state, this nation, and this world for your glory. Lord, do a work through us. Lord, center us in prayer, center us in worship, center us in your word, and then Lord, let us live out the values you show us. We give you all the praise, believing you can do what you say you can do. And we pray this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Can we give God praise tonight for who he is? Seen what you can do, oh 
God of wonders, your power has no end. The things you've done before, in greater measure, you will do again. There's no prison wall you can't break through No mountain you can't move All things are possible There's no broken body you can't raise No soul that you can't save All things are possible
on. Hey, we have a great hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So glad that you all came out tonight. Uh, so glad that you all engage with what's going on. And uh, as Eric said, I think one of the greatest things he says, we have freedom to agree. We have freedom to disagree. You're entitled to your opinions under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's why we did this, to engage. How was the Lord using you to be a witness for him in this culture for his glory? Amen. And amen. So go from this place. If you don't have a church, we'd love to see you. We meet here at 830 and 1030 every single Sunday. We'd love you to be a part of one of our services. Go from this place knowing that you are loved. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.